Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. It's that time again. Thank you so much for joining us this week for Tech Tuesday from Vic Myers Associates, this week in partnership with Wolf Advanced Technology. My name is Ryan Christian, and I'll be the moderator today. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. First, we do have everyone muted except the presenter. Please feel free to use the Q&A section or the comment box in the webinar, and we are happy to answer any of your questions at the end of the presentation. We'll also send a link to the video and the presentation content to all attendees so you can share it with your colleagues or review it again at a later date. You can also see this content and more on our website at vicmyers.com forward slash resources. The tech topic today is marrying NVIDIA GPUs and Xilinx FPGAs to produce winning military and aerospace edge applications. Today's topic is presented by our panelists, CTO at Wolf, Greg Maynard. Greg drives key product strategies for Wolf pertaining to GPU and FPGA processors, video signal processing, materials requirements platforms, IT infrastructure, software development tools, and quality goals. Greg joined Wolf in 1998 as operations manager and was promoted to chief technology officer in 2016. From all of us at the Vic Myers Associates team and our local customers, we all want to just say thanks to you, Greg, for your time and your willingness to share your expertise today. I'm going to go ahead and make you the presenter now. Looks like you are unmuted, and you can take it away. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, you guys allowing us to present. I think this is uh, obviously a pretty interesting topic, so thank you for that. Okay. So uh, today, um, as, as part of the presentation, I wanted to quickly touch on the strengths of uh, what a GPU brings to, to the design, um, as well as FPGA. We're going to look at some of the key challenges uh, that we face when we put those two things together. Um, I want to, um, I've, I've got a couple um, Wolf solutions that I will show, uh, which, which show how uh, COTS modules today and upcoming are using FPGA and GPU together. And I have um, two future concepts that I'll share with you before we uh, open things up to Q&A. So with that, let's get started. So I'd like to um, start this off by going over uh, benefits of the GPU. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, the GPU and the FPGA, they've got their own strengths. Um, and the point of this presentation is really to provide background about both of those technologies. Um, and, and we'll kind of go forward from there. So starting with the GPU, um, the big thing to understand with GPUs is they have many hundreds or even thousands of cores, uh, which make them very good at doing tasks in parallel, running algorithms in par parallel. Um, turns out this is really useful for things like signal intelligence, um, C4ISR applications, electronic warfare, um, and NVIDIA in particular has GPU offerings that really dominate in, in parallel workload tasks, as well as AI inferencing. Um, it's very, and we'll get into this a little bit uh, in a slide or two, it's very easy to leverage IP as well from one NVIDIA GPU processor to the next uh, because of the fundamental programming language CUDA. Um, I'll, I'll dig into CUDA a little bit more, but essentially it's, it's, a, it's a framework um, that provides predefined libraries and accelerators and things that you can leverage. One example of that, um, if you're familiar with MATLAB, it's uh, basically a programming language that lets you, or an application that lets you um, create mathematical equations and um, you can then execute those on a processor. Well, NVIDIA CUDA example has an uh, accelerator for MATLAB. So you can do all of your development in MATLAB and execute it on a, or deploy it on a GPU for uh, and leveraging all of those hundreds or thousands of cores, which is really important. Um, NVIDIA is really dominating AI and inference right now. So it, it turns out the internal structure of the GPU is very well suited to matrix math, which is commonly used in inferencing AI applications. And the GPUs, uh, NVIDIA GPUs, uh, leverage this collection of pre-existing software capability between generations, um, as well as um, internal, and we'll talk about this in a second, internal uh, processor cores, like tensor cores. So really what I want to say with the NVIDIA GPU is they're accelerating both the hardware level and also the software level. And, and those two things together is what we're, we're trying to leverage um, in our designs in particular. 
So this is a, a couple of buzzwords just to get familiar with. So CUDA is NVIDIA's um, proprietary um, programming language. So there's a whole suite of CUDA tools that uh, clients can get access to and use. Um, CUDA cores are single precision math processing units. So there are typically, as I mentioned, hundreds or thousands of these in the GPU silicon. And this is where most algorithms are being accelerated today. Uh, Tensor cores is a fairly new development from NVIDIA. They're 8-bit math accelerators. And it turns out this is really, really good for machine vision um, or object recognition, AI inferencing applications. That's the, 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 um, the type of math required for those is very well suited for Tensor cores. Um, there's another brand new concept from NVIDIA called RT cores. These are 4-bit um, math accelerators. Um, NVIDIA is currently using them primarily in gamer space for things like 3D sound and ray tracing to enhance visuals, but they can also be used just for straight math acceleration. So this is something that's in its infancy, but I do expect um, that applications will start making use of these things in the coming years for a different kind of uh, application. So that, that's something that's, that's interesting. Um, GDDR and HBM, these are uh, memories that the GPU uh, uses to do all of the, the processing uh, that's required. Um, GDDR is typically what we're using now. It stands for Graphics Double Data Rate Memory. It's very fast. Um, it's moving data at speeds of up to 14 gigabit. Uh, HBM is high bandwidth memory. So this is even faster. It's about three or four times the speed. It's basically built into the GPU. Um, and and uh, it, it's very beneficial for uh, low latency, high performance applications. So this technology, the HBM, is not available uh, today um, in, in our market. It's primarily targeting server environment. But we do see, or I do see, that in about two or three years, the GPUs that we sell and the modules we sell will actually have HBM memory inside. And I'll talk about uh, GPU Direct in a little bit. And uh, the other thing to understand when we're comparing GPUs between each other is, is the concept of flops and FOPs. Um, so floating point operations, these are 32-bit um, operations per second versus FOPs would be more like a tensor core. So it could be an 8-bit, 4-bit, 32-bit combination. So you'll, you'll, the way to think of this is the, the FOPS number is always going to be higher than the FLOPS number. And when you're characterizing something for your application, it's really important to understand which type of processing you require so that we can fit the right GPU uh, for your needs. So this is just a quick snapshot of uh, the GPU architectures from NVIDIA. So on the left, uh, you can see the uh, product um, classification from GeForce down to Jets Integra. Um, Basically, GeForce is, is what you would use for, um, you know, as a, as a gamer. So that's, that's something that um, we wouldn't typically work with. Uh, we work primarily with uh, the Quadro class of product, which is a workstation uh, processor. Um, and essentially, the, the reason why we do that is the workstation processor comes with benefits like um, GPU direct acceleration, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, it doesn't. It uncaps uh, video encode and decode channels, which is really important. Um, and it it, um, it basically also allows a higher temperature range of operation, which is key for harsh environment. Obviously, uh, the Tesla product is a, a server class product. It does come with some capabilities like ECC um, and virtualized GPU. Typically, we don't see a lot of need for those um, functions in our in the modules that we sell, but it is a it is an option that we provide. And then finally, the Jetson. This is um, NVIDIA's all-in-one processor. So it's a, it's a ARM processor embedded. It's um, embedded GPU cores. Um, and it also comes with embedded AI tensor cores, which is really interesting. And then the bar along the bottom just shows you the different architectures. So um, current shipping product today is, is Pascal generation product. Um, Volta is an interim step that was never released for Mill and Aerospace. It's only a server class. And Turing... Um, is our latest generation product that we're just shipping now in the next uh, month or two, it's just going through final characterization. And then we're expecting Ampere to be released um, in production by 2021. So now I want to talk a little bit about the FPGA. So the FPGA provides uh, some unique capabilities that a GPU um, is not particularly suited for. First, uh, FPGA designs are extremely low latency. So they can perform logic directly 
on data as it's captured without having to send it outside of the chip. So this, save, this is important. It saves transaction time uh, and uh, uh, buffering and queuing. FPGAs are also extremely flexible. So where GPUs have to put dedicated silicon, the tensor core, the CUDA core, the things I mentioned before, um, the internal structure of an FPGA can be tuned. And sometimes even on the fly uh, for the workload it's processing. So one of the key ways that Wolf uses FPGAs is to connect uh, sensor interfaces into and out of modules. And the FPGA is a great way to do that. So we've built up a stable of interface IP that lets us capture everything from SDI, ARINC 818, Coax Express Digital, to uh, more legacy analog standards like Stanig 3350 or composite video signals. Um, and on, also on top of that library of IP, um, we've built the capability of doing real-time conversion of video um, from the GPU. So the GPU output can be connected like a monitor and it will, the FPGA can convert that to any of the video standards I just mentioned. So this is often how we're connecting high-end processors and legacy sensors and displays. So we often see this as a need um, due to things like a program refresh that demands that we plan for the future, um, as well as supporting existing sensors that are on the vehicle. Uh, so just a couple of terms to get up to speed on uh, with the FPGA. Um, FGX is what we call all of our FPGA implementations. Um, in a few slides, I'll show you the core capabilities of the FGX so you can get a feel for how we use it and how we combine it with the GPU. MPSOC is Xilinx's term for a combination FPGA with an embedded ARM processor in one chip. So this essentially takes an FPGA and turns it into a complete system on a chip. So making it very flexible, um, able to run application code, and uh, that's, that's key to where we see things going next. Bovado is a term you may hear from time to time. Um, essentially, it's just the tool that's used to program, simulate, and pro probe the FPGA. So it's primarily used in development. Um, it'll be, you'll see why that's important when I get uh, into some of our futures. And then finally, the RFSLC is a new class of FPGA processor from Xilinx. This is important um, because it's very well suited to things like software-defined radio, um, phased rate radar applications, um, and other RF applications. And it basically, it packs the analog and digital and digital to analog conversion interfaces all into the FPGA. So it's kind of like an all-in-one device. Just a quick snapshot of um, Wolf's um, leverage of the Xilinx architecture. So the, the boxes in blue um, represent COTS product that we were shipping today, and the, the bubbles in green are basically um, future generation products that are in, in development or uh, future concepts. So basically the seven series is what we use. That's kind of like our, our primary uh, FP, FPGA implementation for all designs that require HD video. So 1080p 60, that's where we basically use that device. Um, UltraScale Plus is a couple generations forward for Xilinx. And we're using the uh, Kintex UltraScale Plus for our 4K video interfaces. And then uh, Versal itself, very interesting with Versal. Every um, Versal chip that's going to be released comes with an embedded ARM core. So that's going to add capability on top of the fact that it's a 7 nanometer process. So the, the performance per watt is going to be lower. Uh, the logic count's going to be higher. And there's a lot of AI um, acceleration that comes with the Versal architecture. So we're really, really excited about uh, where Xilinx is taking their, their uh, architecture next. So this is a, just a dedicated slide to the roadmap of the RF SOC, just so that you can you know, get, a, get a key point of that. Um, what I want to highlight are basically that the RF SOC has three generations of product uh, that are in production today. Um, and they've been, as they're going along, they're increasing the sample rates, increasing the bandwidth rates. Um, and the fourth generation, which is yet to be announced, it's going to come out in the next uh, couple of years, is the one that, that Wolf thinks will be very, very impactful. Um, so basically, the fourth generation um, comes with embedded A72 ARM processors, as well as AI inference acceleration cores. So that's giving um, really a compelling way to process RF data. And so with some of the things that we're doing, we think this is an amazing front end uh, to put onto a GPU. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a, in a couple of slides. 
So let's talk about putting it all together. So why are we doing this? Um, we've got background of technologies. Um, I want to look look deeper and see why these two technologies fit together so well. So we're primarily interested in doing this to reduce system complexity. We want to provide sensor connectivity as close as possible uh, to the GPU so that we are limiting needless data transmission over the backplane. That's really important. Um, that also has the added benefit of reducing latency. Uh, also, when we put these technologies together, it reduces uh, potential slot count in the system. So that's directly hitting size, weight, power, and cost. So this is, I've got a couple slides just showing you, and I'm going to turn on my laser pointer here. There we go. Just showing you how the, whoops, how the FPGA, um, uh, the capabilities of it uh, today. So one uh, function of the FPGA, I mentioned that we connect various sensors. Um, RIP resides within the, the FPGA. Oh, this cursor is not working so well. You know what? That's okay. Um, and each of those sensors can be configured as, as any of the interfaces seen below. So this is a very flexible solution. We're capturing the data and we're pushing it over PCI Express uh, for processing. So then the next capability I want to talk about is conversion. So conversion takes a monitor output. In this case, it's, it's coming from integrated graphics GPU on the SBC. And it can convert that from display port to something like SDI in real time. And that'll allow us to connect things like uh, media recorders, rugged displays, um, other devices as needed um, in analog or digital interfaces, which is very important. The other thing that it can do um, is it can operate as sort of like a soft renderer. So one of the challenges when we put a GPU and an FPGA together is the GPU only has so many outputs it can drive. Typically that's four. Um, so we can actually drive more outputs with the FPGA working in parallel. So we could get to six or eight um, in a single slot solution with one GPU. Um, and the way that it works is we basically um, drive data from the system, the GPU or the SBC, uh, drive that, oops, drive that to the FPGA, and then that gets converted for output. So we can parallel convert a GPU's output and data over PCI Express, which is a very powerful feature. And then this one puts it all together. So this is basically demonstrating the full data path of our capability. So sensor data comes into the Wolf FPGA. That can be driven out. It can be um, DMA'd to a GPU directly um, for processing and analysis. That output can be pushed back in multiple ways. And this basically, the green boxes really represent all that capability can happen in a single module. So just going to go over a couple of the uh, uh, key challenges when we when we put these two technologies together. So power, honestly, is the most challenging aspect of GPUs. Um, they run extremely hot. Um, and combining FPGAs with them adds even more challenge on top of that. So um, two primary ways we deal with that. Um, we over uh, The first, uh, we need to get as much heat out of the module as possible. And we do this by distributing heat between uh, base card and mezzanine and relying on a high-speed thermal path uh, between them to get the heat out. So the way that this works, um, it's, it's really a joint effort between what we're doing at the module level and then what happens at the system level. So it's very important that we work together. So on our side, we utilize things like heat pipes and vapor chambers to move uh, the heat with the very low thermal resistance. And we, work, we have to work very closely with integrator where possible um, to enable the, the system architecture to get the heat away from there. So this can include things like um, heat piping to specific locations in the chassis, um, airflow through, airflow by, and liquid cooling at modular system level. The other important thing to consider uh, is that the GPUs that Wolf use, uh, uses, um, often they're, they're downclocked. They need to be uh, because the GPU is capable of, of of powering more than uh, the system can ever dissipate. So this really means that some form of throttling is imposed uh, within the uh, thermal envelope of the system. And this slide is basically showing an example of what the power control interface looks like. So this is a utility called NVIDIA SMI. Um, and basically the way that this works is when we ship our modules, we will predefine the power envelope 
It could be 60 watts. It could be 100 watts. It depends on the design and the cooling and what we've agreed to with the customer. And then the customer can use this tool to adjust that power envelope on the fly. So if there's um, a different system configuration, if there's different environmental parameters where we're not having to run as hot, um, the customer can, at their own um, discretion, they can make the power limit changes. The other key challenge when we put these things together is, is just raw circuit density. So uh, GPUs have, at least for now, until we get to HPM, they have uh, GDDR memories that have to sit around them. They've got uh, very powerful power supplies. Um, and uh, there's other features that we need to put in there, like PCI Express switching and some other things. And so uh, the way that we're dealing with that problem as we go forward um, with the Turing family and beyond is leveraging um, a mezzanine architecture. So it's new with, with the Turing GPUs. And uh, basically for us, it's like a, a factory integration option. And for, for um, you as system architects, it can basically give you more capability. We can take, the, take a common platform and, and turn it into a machine vision platform where we're combining different kinds of processors and FPGAs or dual FPGAs or multi-GPU even in some cases. Often where we see this, the most bang for the buck is in the, the GPU and uh, FPGA combinations because there's always data to come into the system and the closer we get that to the processor, the, the more efficient your system architecture really is. So regardless of whether we're combining FPGA or, or GPU for data delivery, um, sorry, the data delivery is really the most important, uh, second most important item in, in, the, in this whole concept. So how information moves within the system is critical. And so to understand this, there's two concepts I want to bring up. The first one is GPU Direct. Um, there are multiple flavors of GPU Direct from NVIDIA. The one we're focusing on now um, for these discussions um, allows for an FPGA to do a peer-to-peer -peer communication. So between third-party device and GPU, which third-party device in this case is the Wolf FGX. So this is important. It reduces CPU load. Um, the CPU doesn't have to be involved in moving the data um, stream um, and managing that in detail. It's offloaded. So when we do this on our modules, we also win uh, because the data doesn't have to leave our module. Uh, the data will flow from FPGA to the GPU using a switch that's already on our module. And so uh, particularly in 3 VPX, it means data doesn't have to go out over the backplane, which is key. And then the second concept is NVLink. Um, so for applications that are dealing with large amounts of processing and sharing data between GPU processors like Electronic Warfare, for example, um, NVLink offers a, a pretty unique and, and cool answer. It essentially allows you to connect two GPUs um, using this uh, proprietary NVIDIA bus um, and that allows them to uh, pass data and share data between processors at very low latency and very high speed. So this is faster than PCIe Gen 4. Um, and it, it basically turns these two pro GPU processors into one um, shared heterogeneous processor. So in this case, we add FPGAs into the design and we can basically push data to the GPUs and the GPUs can be working together to solve uh, a larger problem. So this is an example of um, one of the first combination modules that, that Wolf uh, did. Uh, it's currently in production, it's shipping today. Uh, in this design, we've incorporated two uh, FPGAs. And we did this primarily to increase channel density within the slot. So for options, for example, that require less channels, only one FPGA would be populated. And we do this um, you know, to reduce a little bit of heat and a little bit of cost. Um, so we also introduced the concept of a fit module. So this allows us to factory configure um, different analog standards that need to be connected to this module. Um, so depending on the number of channels, whether it's composite or RGB sync on green, we populate or design a new uh, fit module as needed to configure the product. So the data bus um, on this particular design is PCI Express Gen 3. It's configurable up to eight lanes and it supports uh, legacy uh, VPX uh, topology. Also important, the GPU outputs on this one, um, they can be configured in multiple ways. So we're showing it as DisplayPort. Um, it supports DVI or HDMI, or it goes through this path and we're converting it to 
um, you know, SDI output or analog outputs. So this is really a very flexible um, product. Um, we've used it in many different applications. Typically, it's C4 ISR type applications where we've got lots of um, video sensors that we need to process. And this is our uh, current uh, Turing design. So the Turing design is, is uh, the first version of it um, is basically a RTX 5000. So this is like a 10.9 teraflop processor. Um, it can run, uh, it runs up to about 140, 150 watts um, maximum. Obviously, as I mentioned earlier, we, we will cap that at a level that, that's sufficient for your uh, system architecture. And then we combine it with the FPGA for the front end. So this is a very, this is the latest generation, um, highest performance video processor module that's available today. And I think it's, I think it's extremely cool. And the other, the other thing that we've done with this is um, uh, the backplane interface with the PCI Express. Um, it basically um, is mapped entirely to P1. So this allows us to configure this card for legacy VPX systems. Um, but also for uh, SOSA, uh, SOSA aligned systems, which I haven't mentioned SOSA yet. I'll talk about it in another slide or two. Um, other capabilities that come with it are around um, non-transparent bridging um, and daisy chaining. So we can we can actually use the switch that's on this card um, to allow you to connect adjacent slots together, and in some cases that that allows you to reduce uh, system slots again. So very very uh, cool. Um, and where we're going uh, next with this are configurations that leverage the mezzanine architecture that I talked about. So there'll be um, a mezzanine site and we'll be adding different types of uh, FPGA capabilities on that site. So this, this is a monster of a card. I hope that you can see some of the details on it. I know it's fairly detailed. Um, it's based on the Jetson Xavier NX module. So it's, which is about a, a credit card sized system on chip module. Um, being the Jetson class, it comes from, it comes with an embedded ARM processor as well as the GPU CUDA cores. And the NXs also have dedicated tensor cores, which are specifically targeting AI acceleration. So this design is something that we're working with a lead customer on to bring it to market. I'm expecting this to be available sometime next year. And where we see it well suited is in uh, machine vision, video streaming, or multiplexer type applications. So two FPGAs are included in this particular design, um, which is providing up to eight SDI and four analog sensor inputs and outputs um, as a means to uh, front end that uh, with the Xavier uh, processors. Um, really critical to how this whole module works uh, is the intercommunication between all of these um, processors. Each one is independent. Um, so you can have them where they are independent um, and the um, one terabyte drive is associated with, with one of each. Um, but you can also have them working together. And so there's an intermodule communication layer um, that, uh, that's being introduced by a company called Dolphin Interconnect Solutions. Uh, we've done a lot of work with them over the years. Uh, they do some really uh, interesting things with, um, it allows you basically to move data peer-to-peer -peer between these devices, as well as do things like share the storage. So you can have one uh, storage device shared between multiple processors. You can also extend that capability off module. So you might have other processors that you're talking to out here, like a Xeon processor or an other Intel or ARM processor. And uh, the software layer allows all those things to interconnect. So the really important thing to, to just hammer on with this, this design um, is that each processor is extremely capable of things like encoding, decoding, processing, and inferencing. Um, you can program it to be to work symmetrically or asymmetrically. And in all honesty, we don't know all the ways that this can be used. It's it's extremely flexible, and we're we're pretty excited. Uh, the the one application we're in is machine uh, vision, but we're pretty excited to see what other applications get thought up now that this hardware is is coming available. So um, now that we've sort of gone through uh, how what Wolf is doing, how we're combining FPGAs and GPUs together, um, I wanted to quickly touch on a few future concepts to give you an idea of where we're going next and where I, I personally would like to get feedback from all of you. So 
we're currently working on something that we call our um, FGX FDK. Uh, it's a way for Wolf to pack our IP up um, in a particular hardware, Wolf hardware design and give integrators and end users the ability to add their own logic. So you'll have things like SDI interfaces. Um, and this is, this is basically called a block design. So in, in the Vivado tool, this is what it looks like. You would get some blocks that are Wolf specific IP. So say you have a, a Wolf XMC with an FPGA on it, you would get the Vivado design for that. And you would have the ability to put your own logic as, uh, as you see fit. So you can basically add in pre-processing or post-processing, um, security features. Um, there's all different um, things that you'll be able to do with that, that uh, basically let you take the design kind of to the next level. Um, and the other thing with this, of course, is as we march down the path toward, um, you know, more like a Gen 4 RFSOC type product, um, all those capabilities of being able to combine IP are, are critically important. And you're going to want to do that before the data hits um, hits a GPU processor. It'll just it'll be a, it's an opportunity to use some of that available silicon to do some pre-filtering. And then the last one that I wanted to leave you guys with today was um, a next generation uh, three VPX uh, GPU card. Um, I'm calling it a, it's called a switch card here. It's, it's more of a, a high perfor highest performance embedded compute processor in a three VPX space. So um, basically what this design does is it really embraces uh, the SOSA uh, mandate. Um, so for those of you that don't know, SOSA is a, is a requirement in most new system architecture designs, especially in the United States. Um, it basically tries to nail down a limited subset of pin mappings on VPX, so it's trying to simplify this interface um, to improve module and system compatibility. So one way to think of how this all began, this is a VPX module. VPX was very ambiguous about how it defined this. It had far too many architectural choices. Open VPX narrows this down to a, a smaller subset and that helped, uh, but SOSA narrows it down even further. I think there's something like seven profiles or eight profiles that are um, defined at a high level. And so SOSA also, when doing this, it also defined a new pin map. Um, that's that's something new for 3VPX and that it, it defined a 16 lane PCIe interface. So previously, Wolf has provided 16 lane interfaces before, but it's always been for custom systems. This makes the interface more interoperable and open, um, as well as adding some other high speed data buses. So that's exactly what we've done is we've taken that SOSA alignment and said, okay, how do we put a GPU in that place? Will we give it 10 gig, which is SOSA speed today, 10 gig ethernet interfaces, PCIe, um, we add the FPGA for the I/O, and we push the we push the boundary. So we're going PCIe Gen 4, which is not yet defined in in SOSA, um, and we push to 100 gig E on the data plane. And we think this is a really really compelling uh, product. And we can also um, the other thing SOSA does is define coaxial and optical interfaces. So that's where we're adding some capabilities to drive outputs on at least the coaxial interfaces first. Um, and optical interface is second. So um, really, uh, really, really interesting stuff. So that's all that I had for today. Uh, thank you very much for listening in. Hopefully we covered uh, some good ground and I didn't, get, I didn't get too much into the weeds or too distracted. Um, I think that um, honestly, the FPGA and the GPU combined are, are a natural fit. Wolf has been doing this for years um, and Basically, every new design that, that comes out of Wolf is, is combinations of those two technologies. So with that, I'd like to uh, open the floor to any questions. Thank you so much, Greg. We are open for Q&A. Uh, thank you for that great breakdown. Feel free, everyone, to use the Q&A module inside of the webinar. Just type in your questions, and we'll uh, field them here. And just a reminder to everybody, that we will be sending out a replay and on-demand version of the presentation and uh, the slide deck that Greg presented. So um, go ahead and uh, send in your questions. Uh, we'll take them as they come in. First one I've got here for you, Greg, is can we encrypt our own source code on your FPGA? Yes, yes, absolutely. So 
um, the this is an FDK question. So when when you receive the FDK, um, it's basically a Vivado project, and so at that point you have the control to um, leverage you know Xilinx's security features, which includes encrypting your source code. Okay, great. Well, that, I think that answers that uh, very well. What's the highest performing TFLOP NVIDIA system you've designed? Uh, so the one, let me think, the one that we the highest as of to date um, is about 100 teraflops. Um, and we, interestingly enough, we we did a little bit of a modification on the um, on the concept of a GPU processor. So we created a, a switch fabric GPU processor. So it combines sort of LAN and PCIe um, and GPU all together in one. And, and in doing so, that allowed us to put enough GPUs in the system to get us to 100 teraflops. I believe it was a, like an eight eight slot system. Okay, eight slots. Great. Keep the questions uh, coming in, folks. Um, we've got a little bit more time left, and uh, we're happy to answer any questions about your system or anything that you're curious about. One here, is there much demand for the NVIDIA Xavier product? Where do you see that product going? Yeah, uh, we definitely see a lot of demand. Uh, that 6U card that I showed today was came directly from customer demand. Um, last year, we developed what we call the 12TP. That's a 3U VPX Xavier design. And that stirred up so much interest that now we got multiple requests for 6U variants of the same. So um, as far as where I see that going, um, I see uh, in the 3U space, we're going to be adding a version that, that um, has a more powerful FPGA front end. I think that's really interesting. So we're getting up to 10 or 100 gig LAN interface as well as um, video interfaces. Um, and then in the 6U, um, there's there's some variants that we can play with that FPGA um, and also the way that we're doing uh, the intermodule communication offerings. I think that'll be very interesting to some people. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I think that's a really, Xavier's been a really interesting product for us. Okay, great. Thank you. You mentioned RFSOC. Could you repeat what version you're going to get involved in and and why? Yeah, so we're looking at uh, getting involved in, in Generation 4. Um, the reason why we want to do that um, is because Generation 4 comes with more, uh, it comes with the A72 uh, ARM, ARM processor. It hasn't been announced officially yet, but but, you know, internal belief here is that it's going to come with a higher performance ARM processor, which we think is very important for things like software-defined radio and other applications like that. Um, also comes with the Versal AI cores, um, and also interested in uh, the fact that it's the 7 nanometer process node. Um, so there'll be some savings um, on, on power that we're interested in. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to give it just uh, another minute or two here. And uh, while we wrap up, I'll just remind everybody, uh, feel free to get a hold of anyone. Um, if you have questions regarding the Wolf products, um, feel free to reach out to your, your local uh, VMA team or just reach out to sales at vicmyers.com. We're happy to get you connected. Um, I know uh, we've learned that if we can get you guys involved early, um, then it, it will definitely help the, help the systems architect uh, really get to the bottom of what you guys can provide and how you can help them. So uh, we're happy to do that. Feel free to reach out to us at sales at vicmyers.com and we'll get you connected with your local resource and the Wolf team. Well, I don't see any questions coming in here, uh, Greg, so I'm going to wrap it up. And just uh, once again, say thank you to you and the entire team for taking the time to put together the presentation. We know that takes a lot of work. It was a very interesting topic. And uh, we'll, we'll make sure to uh, get the content out for everyone uh, who missed it as well as those who attended so they can watch it on demand. So with that, thank you very much. And thanks for attending Tech Tuesday. We look forward to talking with you soon. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks for having us.
We appreciate it. Take care.